Welcome to A Girl in Concern. Like that last sign says, the uh, system is not broken. It was uh, designed that way. To some degree, I think everybody would agree on that nowadays, but I think that that, that whole idea came out of, it was, uh, was emphasized by the, by the uh, Occupy movement that came out of Wall Street last October. But uh, I have to apologize. I don't have the woman's name that was was in the background of that of that little video clip. There, she was a one of the performers at the at the Hanford rally that happened on was it April 15th over there in Richland. Uh, powerful blues voice. And uh, when I get her name, I'll I'm going to be using her in the future. I'll give her some credit for that for that little piece that she does. Ain't going to let no corporations turn me around. Ain't going to let no radiation turn me around. Ain't going to let no politicians turn me around. And uh, we need to be steadfast in what we believe. Uh, according to uh, one of the crew members, the uh, NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, Authorization Act there was just uh, overturning to the one, of one of the provisions, one of the most egregious, and there was many uh, provisions, uh, which I think speaks to uh, allowing uh, Obama to incarcerate uh, American citizens indefinitely, which just flies in the face of the of the uh, Constitution, the many many of our rights. I don't remember all the number of of articles in the Constitution that that kills. And uh, I keep thinking that you know Obama will never shock me anymore. But it shocks me that he had his lawyers in court to stand up for the fact that uh, we need this provision to be able to take take out people who are you know, uh, activists who are uh, anti-war, who, who uh, uh, media, who are speaking. And Chris Hedges and a few other people sued and was, went before the federal court. I don't remember if it was the appeals court or just a federal court or what. You can bet it's going to bump up to the next court above it really quickly. But they sued because they actually proved that they have not published certain things and cut out certain things the things that they have published due to the fact that they thought you know if Obama could use this and they could be sent to Gitmo or they could be sent into a detention without without with a detention without end and uh, other people have uh, also uh, testified to that same thing that they, they they were afraid to speak out because of that draconian law Machiavellian law even one would say uh, the government is not the be-all and end-all. The government is not the, the uh, tyrant of the people, although it is moving that way. The people are the government. And it's, real, it's the laws like this, I'm not going to say starting with the Patriot Act, but the Patriot Act was a big one, that are moving us in that direction to where, to where uh, people are afraid to speak their mind and who knows, pretty soon they may be afraid to think their mind. I don't know. That Maybe that's what they're heading for. hate to use the word hey, they, but in this case, they means the government and those who run the government, which are that one little fish with all the little fish behind it. That's the government. That's the 1% who basically are interchangeable terms anymore. The government is just the, uh, the public sector of the, of, the, uh, of the corporations, and the corporations are basically the the private sector of the government you know they're almost interchangeable to and uh, they are working against democracy they may not view it that way they may not uh, talk about it that way but uh, either corporations can run the world or the world can be a dem democratic and uh, we're finding out uh, if, if anybody goes to any news sources other than the, the corporate media who give you a little thin veneer they're basically covering things up not covering 
the global South is pointing the way, and a lot of it is in, in South in South America, pointing the way to how to run a democracy. We've had folks on the show in the past who have talked about how important it is to to uh, pay attention to what's going on in the global South because they have a participatory democracy, one that uh, we no longer have here. And you know the people are at least half to blame. I shouldn't go on and on and on about the government and corporations and the media because it's the people who have allowed this to happen. You know, they they want it's it's a me 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 generation. We have all these things we could lose now. We have uh, the the uh, the ease of life and like I was just seeing on TV the other day, only one percent or if that of of people. <clears throat> who have gone to these wars, these illegal immoral wars, 1%, and that probably includes their families and all who touch, are touched by the service, uh, the, rest of, the rest of the country don't feel a thing. We certainly don't feel what the people in Pakistan or, uh, or uh, the uh, Yemen or the places that are getting these drone bombs dropped on them. So there's a lot to be kept, kept in mind when we watch the corporate news, because I think we need to watch the corporate news, but we don't necessarily need to believe it. It's just one perspective, and it's a very shallow perspective quite often. <clears throat> one of the things we need to pay attention to is the, the beating of the war drum to, for Iran. And there is a rally, to, or I should say a forum tomorrow. We can get that graphic up when they get to it here. Uh, from 1 o'clock to, th that's it. Iran Forum, Myths and Facts. Tomorrow, 1 to 4.30, First Unitarian Church. It's a bit long, but uh, there's going to be four speakers. They all had Middle, Middle Eastern names. <coughs> Excuse me. So those are going to be people that are going to be giving you facts <coughs> that you're not going to get from the pundits on corporate, corporate uh, TV, whether it's MSNBC or CB, uh, uh, CNN, Fox News. I shouldn't even use put that in there with the other two because even though these folks these news organizations do interview folks that have knowledge and are from the Middle East I think you're gonna find out if you attend this that these folks have a whole different slant on what's going on over there and uh, we we definitely need information because uh, going to war with Iran is gonna be a whole lot different thing than going to war with with Afghanistan or or uh, or Iraq, and we need we need to keep that in mind. And I'll try to remember to mention that. You go you go to um, the calendar there at uh, PortlandIndiaMedia.org, and uh, you can find out a little bit more about that. Get the names of the folks. <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about what the show is going to be about. There was a rally the other day, a couple Mondays ago, uh, with uh, Robert F. Kennedy was one of the major speakers. He uh, he had a lot to say, and, and uh, we're going to be listening to him in a little while. Uh, but before that, we're going to hear some of the other speakers. Uh, they all had a lot to say. They all nailed it, in my mind. Uh, I don't know how many million tons or pounds of coal are going to be coming across. Uh, they, wanna, they, want to pro they propose to bring it through the Columbia Gorge and through five, five separate uh, uh, ports. Uh, Coos Bay, Bellingham, uh, St. Helens, a couple others, and uh, there's a lot of people that want to stop that. 500 pounds of coal dust, I think, from each load, each train, not the whole train, but each car, was going to be lost. And uh, we shouldn't even be doing that anymore. We need to be spending our time and money on, on uh, sustainable excuse me, the sustainable energy, not, not the energy that we've been doing all along. This is the 21st century. This is not the 20th century or the 19th century. So we need to move along here. Uh, we're going to play this video. It's about 22 minutes of, of the speakers up until Robert F. Kennedy took the stage. So uh, we'll be back in, in that time frame. What we're talking about is over 150 million tons of coal per year being strip mined in Wyoming and Montana and then coming through Oregon and Washington on 30 coal trains per day. These are uncovered coal trains spewing toxic coal dust and diesel pollution about a mile and a half long every single day, 365 days of the year. 
Now these coal trains would be coming through dozens of communities in the Pacific Northwest from Spokane through the iconic Columbia River Gorge, Vancouver, Longview, communities up and down Puget Sound, as well as right here in the city of Portland. In fact, here in Portland, we'd be looking at 12 coal trains per day polluting Portland neighborhoods. But these coal companies have a big problem on their hands, as we can see from the size of the crowd here. They have no idea how hard we will fight to protect our health, to protect our clean air and water, and to fight for environmental justice. As many of you know, Oregon and Washington are two states that are literally leading the nation in shutting down our only coal-fired power plants because they are bad for our lungs, they're bad for our water, and they're bad for our climate. If coal is too dirty to burn here, it is simply unacceptable to be shipping it overseas to China. As you can see from all the banners around us, there is a growing movement called the Power Past Coal Coalition, and many of you today here, individual citizens who are fighting hard and we are winning. I want to recognize some of these amazing groups. We have the Sierra Club, Greenpeace US, Climate Solutions, Friends of the Columbia Gorge, Rising Tide, Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Fighting Strip Mines, the Western Organization of Resource Councils. We also have the Waterkeeper Alliance Conference going on right now here in Portland. The Waterkeeper Love. And there are water keepers across the West who are fighting to protect their water bodies, their rivers, their sounds, their lakes from coal export, including keepers for the Spokane River, the Columbia River, Puget Sound, North Sound Bay, Lake Ponderé, as well as uh, the Cook Inlet Keeper in Alaska. Right here in Oregon on the Coos Bay, we also have Coos Bay Water Keeper. <laughs> So we have an amazing lineup of speakers this afternoon, uh, both local and regional as well as international speakers, and of course one of the most preeminent national environmental fighters, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. So to get us started, it is my privilege to introduce the chair of the Multnomah County Commission, Jeff Kogan. He is a lifetime community activist. His accomplishments include reforms to the business income tax, growing fresh food for the Oregon Food Bank on surplus county land, as well as fighting crucial efforts to support our returning veterans. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Kogan. Hi everyone, what a great turnout. Thanks for coming out. So a core part of Multnomah County's mission is protecting the public health. And we take that role seriously. That's why we've been working hard to improve our local air quality by reducing diesel emissions. It's why we've been working to protect our residents by reducing toxics like BPA and benzenes. And it, yeah, well, that deserves it, but come on, reducing toxics, come on. And it's also why we've partnered with the city of Portland to make the most ambitious climate action plan in the country. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my partner and environmentalist partner at the city of Portland, Commissioner Amanda Fritz, who's here with us right now. And protecting the public health is why I'm here today. I am deeply concerned about these plans to ship 150 tons, a million tons of coal a year through the Columbia River Gorge and through our community. If it's approved, we're talking about as many as 50 coal trains, a mile and a half long, going through the Columbia River Gorge and through Multnomah County every day. 50 coal trains, 75 miles of coal trains. It's going to turn the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area into the largest coal chute in the nation. And it's going to be exposing our local communities to significant health risks. Coal is dirty. 
It's, it's full of toxic chemicals like mercury and arsenic. And don't believe that just because these coal trains are passing through our community that we don't have a health risk. We do. The simple fact is coal dust leaks off these trains in large quantities. BNSF Railway says each coal car leaks off 500 pounds of coal dust in each trip. And we're talking about tens of thousands of coal cars going through our community. This is nasty stuff, this coal dust. Just last week, PGE said that they didn't want a coal terminal near one of their power plants because the coal dust is too dirty. But just, just think about that for a second. Just think about that for a second. Coal dust is too dirty to be next to a power plant and they want to put it through our neighborhoods. Is that okay? No. That's a terrible idea. And I haven't even talked about global climate change yet. Climate change is something we care about in Oregon, and we've made real progress in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And in just 10 years, we will be rid of our only coal-fired power plant in Oregon. That's yeah. tremendous progress. Lots of states are starting to cut down on coal power because it's so dirty. But if we simply export this coal to Asia, we're not getting any real environmental benefits. We're exporting the pollution. We can't. That's what these coal pro export facilities are going to do. It's going to ensure a future of climate destabilization, wreaking havoc on people and ecosystems around the globe. Is that the future we want? No! no. And it's not the future we need either. We can stand up and we can stop this. And I see all these people here today, I know we can stop this. Yeah. Now you're going to hear a lot about how we have to do this because it creates jobs. And it's true that there are some jobs created in this, but we have to be smart about job growth. We can't sacrifice public health for just a few jobs. And remember, we're just talking about a few jobs here. One estimate found that an average coal export terminal facility would create as many jobs as two Starbucks coffee shops. Who wants to sell out their children's future for two couple of dozen jobs? That's not the future we need. That's not the future we need to create. Luckily, we live in Oregon where our governor gets it. Yeah. Governor yeah. Kitzhaber. Yeah. Yeah. Governor Kitzhaber has asked the Department of the Interior to do an environmental impact assessment of what these coal facilities will do to our region. And that is the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. We, we need to ask these questions. We need to find what the impact will be to our public health. What it will mean for traffic at rail crossings and freight movement. What it will mean for fish living in our rivers. And what it will mean for people who eat those fish. What's it going to mean for the cancer rates, lung disease, heart disease, asthma, emergency room visits? These are questions that we have a right to the answer to. And we shouldn't take a simple answer that, oh, it's just going to create jobs. We need to know what the impact of these facilities are. That's what we can do. That's what we need to do. Together, we can stop this. Thanks, everyone, for coming out today. Our next speaker is Dr. Andy Harris. He's on the advisory board of Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, an organization that's championing protecting our communities from coal export. Thank you. Nice day, nice crowd. Good to have you here. Well, I moved to Oregon in the 1970s because I was looking for the clean environment and the progressive ideas of this state. Today we pride ourselves on fostering clean, clean and renewable energy, such as wind and solar power. Our one coal burning power plant, as you he have heard, is being shut down within the next decade. Yes. So let's not take a step backward into the 19th century fossil fuel. Other than nuclear energy, coal is the dirtiest, most toxic fuel on the planet. Why would we want to permit the? Uh, why would we want to promote the use of coal when it is harmful to everybody along the line? Uh, not only its workers, but all the people that live alongside the train tracks and near the mines and the barges and and the loading docks. Coal dust is a major health problem for people with allergies, asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and heart disease. Coal dust also contains toxic metals like mercury and lead and arsenic. Not even PGE, as you've heard this morning, currently, who currently runs uh, the coal burning power plant in Boardman, 
wants a coal export terminal next to them at the port of St. Helens. According to their spokesperson, the coal dust could be a substantial problem for their equipment. Well, it's a far greater problem for the lungs of our kids, for asthmatics, for people with emphysema, and for the elderly. It seems like nobody really wants a coal export terminal next to them. And so how are the trains and the barges going to be powered through our communities? Oh, well, it's going to be with diesel, which is a known uh, carcinogen. And the coal then that gets shipped to Asia not only harms the residents of China and India, but it also comes back to haunt us in the form of these toxic emissions, uh, such things as mercury and sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides and ozones and 50 other toxic chemicals will be coming back here. What happens is, uh, it, it lands from the atmosphere onto our mountains, onto our land, and then the, uh, these toxins run off into our rivers, into our streams, into our lakes and reservoirs, and they contaminate the fish that we eat and the water that we drink. So one of the most toxic byproducts of coal is mercury. I'm just going to say a few words about mercury because it's a potent neurotoxin and it damages the developing brains in infants and in fetuses. It's estimated that between 300 and 600,000 children are born in the United States each day, each, each year, with dangerously high levels of uh, mercury in their bodies. And that puts them at risk of several things like developmental disabilities, mental retardation, uh, seizures, and disturbances of gait and of speech. But there's still more, one more. Coal burning power plants are also a leading cause of carbon dioxide and global climate change. Oregon faces particular threats because it is expected that we will have less rain and snowpack. Therefore, we're going to have diminished water. And the water is needed for our fish and for watering our crops uh, and for our reservoirs and for hydropower. Also predicted are more frequent and severe forest fires, increased forest pests and other diseases, and more violent storms and, and, uh, and flooding. So Amer America in general needs to get out of the coal, pro coal burning process. We don't have to extract coal. We can leave it in the ground. It's not doing any harm there. For Oregon's to promote dirty toxic coal, at a time that we herald ourselves as a leader in clean energy is just only going to give us a black eye. So let's stop the trafficking in coal through our communities dead in its tracks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Our next speaker is Tony Montgomery. Tony is a grandmother who lives in Vancouver, Washington, and she is currently impacted by coal trains. I'm here to educate Oregon as to what is happening to us in Vancouver. I live along the Lewis and Clark Trail on the Columbia River in Vancouver, Washington. We have two to three uncovered coal trains past my home each day. This route from the Powder River Basin goes through the Washington cities of Spokane, Washougal, Camas, and Vancouver, traveling next to the Columbia River. The coal trains take coal to Centralia, Washington, and on to Vancouver, Canada. This roundabout route is because Canada does not want dirty coal spreading toxins and dust on Canadian land. Canada is more than willing to let coal destined for can Canadian ports dirty the Columbia River and most of the state of Washington and Oregon too. The coal passes 100 feet from my back door, blowing coal dust into my yard. Coal dust covers my plants, killing some and smothering others. I must wash my patio each day. I can't have my windows and doors open because the coal comes in the house. We removed a tree last year due to coal dust damage. I have severe allergies and my allergies are getting worse. Coal dust is harming the residents in Washington State, the smallest and most vulnerable. Our children will suffer long-term health issues. 
Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Railroad estimate that from the Powder River Basin to Longview, Washington, each uncovered car loses 500 pounds of coal in the form of dust and chips. My home is located in an area with abundant wildlife. We saved a chum salmon spawning ground. It is endangered. The trains travel over our spawning water that delivers it to the little salmon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and to see my good friend, Amanda Fritz from the City Council. Woo! Thank you for all you do, Amanda. As mentioned, I work for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission representing uh, Umatilla, Warm Springs, Yakima, and Nez Perce. And each of our four tribes have treaty rights that were signed with the United States in 1855. And those treaty rights, we reserved our right to, far to harvest salmon. And we can't let that right ever slip. And when I heard about these coal trains coming through, I remember when, as a child fishing along the Columbia and seeing coal trains coming through, and they even come through now. And when they do, coal dust drops everywhere. And our fishermen fish right on the river, right next to these tracks. And a lot of our tribal fishermen have to cross the railroad tracks, and some of them die. And with all these new trains coming through, they're probably going to have to build new tracks, making it even more dangerous for us to exercise our Treaty Indian fishing rights. I remember thinking about uh, watching the news not too long ago when I heard the phrase, clean coal technology. What a joke! Coal is dirty and it's disgusting. And they want to put that in our communities. We need to say no. What does coal do to our, our climate? It makes it worse. We all know about climate change, the challenges we have ahead of us. We all invest all of our money. You all invest your money in bringing back salmon. And coal trains and coal, all this dirty coal coming into our communities makes it worse. We need to say no to coal trains. No! Well, I have to think what a crazy world we live in when we have coal trains coming down the Columbia just so it can go get burned in Asia and they can send back what? Mercury and acid rain. We need to say no to coal trains. No! How do we do it? We write to our, our leaders. And the two most important people right now are the Governor of Oregon and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who will be taking care of the permits. We need to tell them that we don't want dirty coal in our backyards. We don't want dirty coal in our lungs and we don't want dirty coal in our rivers or our fish. No to coal trains! No! Thank you! Thank you for supporting Treaty Rights! Thank you! Well, we're honored today, as I mentioned, the Waterkeeper Alliance Conference is in full swing here in Portland. And we have Jin Hao, who's a river keeper, a water keeper from China, who is joining us today to share his perspective on coal export. Best wish is from China. I'm Hao, Shantong River water keeper. So just at a test, anyone know coal? In Chinese? No. no. I can tell you. Mei. 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 And you know, Mei has a, another meaning in Chinese. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> Thank you. They have the same pronunciation. <laughs> I've learned Oregon is shutting down coal power plant because the pollution is too great. And there are plans to export that coal to China. What does it mean? Today, China leads the world in renewable energy production. The Chinese government has committed 17% reduction of carbon dioxide uh, per unit GDP between 2010 and 2015. Yeah. And more and more energy companies in China are moving towards clean energy. Yeah. However, like businessmen all around the world, these companies can change their mind if 
they will face a lower cost and more profit. A cheap supply can only encourage more coal burning. What does it mean? It means over environment and Chinese people may suffer more pressure. We struggle to reduce pollution in China and clean up over rivers. We care about our clean water, clean air, and a clean environment. China should not become the dumping ground for your coal industry. We, Chinese people, need clean air, clean water, no dirty U.S. coal. Remember the word, coal in Chinese? May, another meaning is? No. Yes, we Chinese have black eyes and black hair, but it doesn't mean we naturally should use more black cone. We are on our way to seek brightness with our black eyes. We will work with our partner waterkeeper groups and stand with you in fighting for clean energy, clean water, clean air. We hope every single decision we make, every single speech we deliver, and every single action we adopt today is leading to solutions to no pollution, clean world for us, for our generations in the future. Thank you. That was the first set of speakers from the, uh, the uh, Power Pass Coal rally that happened recently. Uh, one of the things I took away from that was that Riverkeeper Alliance, which I hadn't heard of, it's an international organization, and Hao Zing there was from China. Uh, if you go to the Riverkeeper Alliance website, which whatever it was up there, riverkeeperalliance.org or whatever, you can get into the China uh, Riverkeeper Alliance. Uh, it was way too long a URL to even bother with to put it up there. But anyway, that was, a, that was a very good rally. There's a lot of important things said. And another thing I took away from it, this is not a local issue, obviously. We have a person from China there. It, uh, it, it, go, it cuts across uh, basically the whole planet. It's a planetary issue. Whether it's China or whatever, this, this dust, this stuff gets in the air. It goes around the planet. Like we know, there's, you don't find even a pristine lake up in, up in Canada, I understand, will have a little mercury or sulfur due to uh, coal burning, whether it's, it's the power plants or, or uh, however, however this, this stuff is industrialized. So bad deal. We need to step up and we need to stop it. And uh, we're going to hear... And a very important talk that came up after that. I, I was actually there. I was taping it. I was ill. I wasn't able to stand in that sun. And just as Robert F. Kennedy came on stage, I lasted a couple of minutes and had to leave. Well, a very big disappointment to me. That was, that was worse than being sick. But anyway, <coughs> Frank Mahoney was there. He was, <coughs> he was getting video B-roll. So he got a lot of it, but he's from the side. He didn't really have the, the premier location I had right in front. But we're putting it together anyway because the, the content of this talk is so important. <clears throat> he talks a lot about the, the power of the coal industry and what they have done with mountaintop removal on the East Coast where they have taken mountains and just hundreds of them and just knocked them off and put them into the valleys next to it, poisoning people's lives and uh, a, an, an incredible crime against humanity and an incredible crime against the planet. And so... Uh, Robert Kennedy talks for about 15 to 17, 17 minutes, I believe, and uh, he, makes a, he connects the dots between what has been going on on the East Coast and what they're trying to do here in the West Coast and, the, some, and some of the same uh, uh, ways of going about things, some of the same strategies. So uh, Robert F. Kennedy will be back in about 17 minutes. Thank you. 
It is my privilege to introduce our final speaker today, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Named by Time Magazine as a hero of our planet, Mr. Kennedy is the chairman of the Waterkeeper Alliance, and as many of you know, one of the greatest champions of our time for clean air and clean water. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you very much, and please excuse my voice. I want to thank Gene Howe again. Let's give him a big, big applause. And Gene Howe is one of uh, seven water keepers that we now have been working around China. Almost all of them are fighting coal. Um, I want to introduce another keeper who's we got in this area. Let me just read this because we got so many of them. But fighting coal in this area, we got the Willamette, we have the Tualatin, the Rogue River, the Klamath River Keeper, the Columbia River Keeper, the Cook Inlet Keeper, the Spokane River Keeper, the Puget Sound Keeper, North Sound Bay Keeper, the Coos Water Keeper, and Lake Ponderay in Idaho. All of them are fighting uh, coal plants or transfer stations in their areas. Now I'm going to bring up somebody else just to show you what he looks like. We have a, uh, one of the leaders, the Canadian River Keepers. We have about a whole lot of river water keepers in Canada. And this is Mark Madison. He's our first Madison. He's our first. So, and he pioneered a lot of the laws in Canada, the Fisheries Act, for suing the big polluters. But a couple of years ago, we sued, we used Canadian law, him, him and me, to sue Detroit Edison, which was a utility in Detroit that was burning coal, and the mercury from the coal was coming over and poisoning people in Canada. And when we sued them, they said the same thing that all the coal companies have been telling us for 30 years when we, when we tell them, your mercury is poisoning our local people. They all say the same thing. They say, that mercury in the fish is not coming from our plants, it's coming from China. So, and this is what the industry says. And we now know that the fish and the cascades, that the salmon in Portland and up and down the coast are contaminated every single salmon in the, on the coast of the Northwest United States and, and, uh, and in Vancouver has dangerous levels of mercury in its flesh. We now know sought by scientific proof that that mercury is coming from Canada, from China. So why are we taking these, this coal, American coal, sending it over to China so that they can send us back the acid rain and that they can send us back the mercury to poison our fish? That's something we shouldn't be doing. Well, you can you can stay, sit down now, Mark. I just wanted to thank you so much for your Coal is crime. And I've been fighting the coal industry for 30 years. And a lot of the coal that you're going to see coming through here, if you let them get away with this crime, is going to come from the Powder River Basin and it's going to come from up in Canada. The coal that I've been fighting has been mainly in Appalachia. And I'm going to tell you what I've seen in Appalachia. Because the same thing that happened to Appalachia is what's going to happen here if you let coal into your community. Because wherever coal comes, it's toxic. And it's toxic not for just for adults, it's toxic for children, and it's toxic for our democracy, and it's toxic for all of the values that make America an exemplary nation. Coal is the enemy of our country, and it's the enemy of everything we stand for. And if you don't believe that, I tell you, go to West Virginia and see what it's like in coal country, where they don't have democracy anymore, literally. Where there's whole communities, you know, coal says, well, we're bringing prosperity to the state. But just the odd, which is what they'll tell you here. They'll say, oh yeah, if you let us bring the coal through here, we'll bring you jobs and we'll bring you prosperity, and that's a lie. 
And that's what they told for a hundred years. They told the people of West Virginia. My father used to say about West Virginia, it's the richest state in the nation because of the value of the coal beneath the land. But it has the poorest people of any state except for Mississippi. Coal doesn't share its wealth. It keeps it for itself. And it makes a few people billionaires by impoverishing everybody else. And anybody who touches coal gets poisoned by it. And you don't just get sick. It poisons your democracy, it poisons your community, it poisons your values. What I would say to you is coal is crime. Do not let it come through this community. Because it's... It's not just going to poison the people who, are, who happen to have the misfortune of living near the railroad tracks. It's going to poison everybody it touches. It's going to poison your city council. It's going to poison your mayor. It's going to be. It's going to poison the state legislature. It's going to poison the governor, and it's going to poison your children, your groundwater, the air you breathe, and it's going to poison the whole and distort the whole economic system here. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in West Virginia, and I've seen in coal country in West Virginia. If you've, I've driven through 30 communities in West Virginia that were once thriving communities with union halls and with churches and with schools, and there's nothing left. The landscapes have been empty. The coal companies come in and they say, we're gonna mine, we can't have you here because the explosions, because the dust, we don't want you, we're gonna poison your water, we're gonna poison your well. We don't want to pay you the damages, so we're just going to pay you to move. And when we pay you, you're going to sign a contract. And the contract says that you can never move back into this county again. And that's the contracts that they sign. So the people, you can drive through coal country in West Virginia to towns like Whitesville, and they're just, the only thing left are boarded up union halls, boarded up homes, and boarded up uh, churches and schools, etc. The agways are closed, the grocery stores are closed, there is no economy left. That is the legacy of coal, and it's the legacy of coal everywhere it goes. Two years ago, I had a lawsuit in West Virginia, and I've been fighting the coal industry in that state for three decades. And I had a lawsuit in West Virginia, and we won the biggest judgment, and it's a six and a half week jury trial. We won the biggest judgment in the history of the state, I went back about a year ago to appeal that judgment in front of the West Virginia Supreme Court, which incidentally is owned by the coal industry and which cut the judgment down to essentially nothing. West Virginia, like I say, they don't put money into any infrastructure that doesn't benefit the coal industry. And I said to the driver, why is this, is this road so smooth? And he said, because there's 22 inches of asphalt on this road. And every inch of asphalt cost the taxpayer millions of dollars per lane per mile. And I knew why there was 22 inches of asphalt, because the coal trucks weigh 90,000 pounds, and they will pulverize a less robust road. But it's not the coal industry that's paying for that road. It's the people of the state, and it's the federal taxpayer. So when coal says that it's cheap and it's clean, we know they're lying when they say they're clean. But they're also lying when they say they're cheap. If they really had to internalize their costs, if they had to pay the true costs that they are charging to the rest of us, they would be the most catastrophically expensive way to boil a pot of water that's ever been devised. They simply... They could not, they could not compete in the fields of free market capitalism. The only way they compete is by subverting democracy, escaping the application of the law, and then he, and then winning. I'm not exaggerating. Last August, the National Academy of Science released a 10-year report that said that every freshwater fish in America now has dangerous levels of mercury in its flesh. We are living every fish. We are, li and that mercury is coming primarily about 85 percent of it from coal-burning power plants. We are living in our country in a science fiction nightmare today, where my children and the children of most Americans can now no longer engage in the seminal, primal activity of American youth, which is to go fishing with their father or mother. 
you can go to EPA's website and you can find about a half dozen peer-reviewed studies that are published on that web website by the Harvard School of Public Health and others that say that ozone and particulates, which is another class of pollutants from coal-burning power plants, cost this country $345 billion annually in health care costs. We could pay for Obamacare half a dozen times over just by eliminating those two pollutants from, from coal-burning power plants. According to these publications, there are between 47 and 60,000 Americans who die every year from burning, from breathing ozone and particulates from those uh, power plants. That's 20 times the number of people who were killed in the World Trade Center attacks, but not just once, year after year after year. I live, and that's 10 million asthma attacks, a million lost work days. These are parts of the cost of coal that they don't tell you about when they say, oh, it's only 11 cents a kilowatt hour. They're not telling you that out of your other pocket, you're paying $345 billion and burying 60,000 Americans every year. If a foreign enemy, a foreign nation, did to our country what the coal industry does to us every day, we would consider it an act of war. Now, I live two hours south of the Adirondack Mountains. This is the oldest protected wilderness on the face of the earth. It's been protected as forever wild since 1888. Uh, they cost a half a billion dollars for a single machine. And they practically dispense with the need for human labor, which indeed is the point. When my father was fighting strip mining in Appalachia back in the 60s, I remember a conversation I had with him when I was 14 years old, where he said to me, they're not just destroying the environment, they're permanently impoverishing these communities because there is no way that they can regenerate an, uh, an economy from these barren moonscapes that are left behind. And he said they're doing it so they can break the unions. And that's exactly what they did. When he told me that, there were 151,000 unionized mine workers in West Virginia digging coal out of tunnels in the ground. Today, there are fewer than 14,000 miners left in the state. There are more people working in Walmart in West Virginia than in the coal industry. Fewer than half of them are unionized because the strip industry, the industry broke the UMW. And they're taking more coal out of West Virginia with one at one, nine out of ten workers fired. Two days from when we got that decision, lobbyists for Massey Coal and Peabody Coal met in the back door of Gail Norton's Interior Department with her first deputy chief, Stephen J. Griles who was a former lobbyist for Massey Coal and Peabody Coal and who is now serving a ten and a half month jail sentence in the federal penitentiary but too late for the mountaintop because together in that dark room they hatched a plan where they rewrote the interpretation of one word of the Clean Water Act, the definition of the word fill to change thirty years of statutory interpretation and to make it legal for the first time to effectively overrule Judge Hayden's decision and make it legal to dump rock, debris, rubble, garbage, any solid material into any waterway of the United States without a Clean Water Act permit. And this is why I always say, wherever you see coal, you'll see the subversion of our democracy. You'll see the destruction of the democracy at the local level, the disappearance of planning boards, the disappearance of zoning laws. They don't have those anymore in West Virginia. You can't, if you live in West Virginia, you don't have the power as a local person to zone out mountaintop removal mine. They just tell you we're going to do it. You don't have property rights anymore. They can go onto your property and plow it under the ground and you, you have no right to object. They, there's no transparency left in government. Everything is done in secret. 86,000 coal miners in America, 96,000 people employed by the solar industry and 70,000 people employed by wind. So within two years, wind is going to have more people than the coal industry. So we're beating them, and we're forcing them to pay. In Toronto, Mark Madsen has helped get the government of Toronto to make a commitment to end all coal, and they blew up the last coal plant about a year ago. They just blew it up. 
And we know how evil coal is, and we're going to get rid of it in our country. So what are they going to do? They need to stay in business, as the Chinese waterkeepers just told you. And what they're going to do is they're going to say, we still need to sell this coal. We can't sell it to America because they know what the story is. So now we're going to sell it to China. And the place that they're going to pick that they desperately need is the Columbia River Basin to put all their terminals and they're going to ship it through your neighborhoods and they're going to corrupt your politicians and poison your children and give you cancer if you let them. And I would ask you, are you going to let them do this to your community, what they've done to West Virginia? Oh, uh, I guess we got. I guess we got some problems with the uh, CG. We're trying to get it. We're trying to get an image up to you. Uh, I don't really know what's going on, but it looks like we're just black here. But anyway, um, he nailed it. Like nobody I know has nailed it in quite some time. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some images up here real quick. Uh, I took away from that a lot, but what he said was coal is a crime. I think is something that should be said. They're, they, they're trying to say that uh, coal is clean, clean coal. No way. Coal is a crime. What he said is that uh, a few billionaires are made from it. A, f a few people get jobs. And then uh, the, re the majority of the people are impoverished. It poisons democracy. It poisons the community. And it poisons values. Now, uh, that ain't very cool. And like... That's not going to stop unless the people stop it. And uh, it's up to the people to stop this thing. And, and, and uh, they made a really good start at it the other day. And uh, it was a losing battle on the East Coast with mountaintop removal. We know that. We've been seeing that. And uh, any, anybody that's been paying any attention to it, there's a number of websites. You go to mountaintop removal. Uh, we've covered it on the show uh, in the past. Uh, I'm sure other other public access programs has as well. There we are. I never was so happy to see my my image in my life. Nobody wants to stare at a black screen. But uh, thanks for the text for coming in and figuring that out, getting past the uh, the problems we had with the uh, with the the character generator. But anyway, I'm running out of voice here. If they want to put up a, a phone number, if anybody wants to call up, talk about this. Also, I saw that Carrie Brunette, the folks that are running the uh, the program uh, City Lights will be on at 9 o'clock. Uh, we'll have Miriam German and a few other folks that are involved with the anti-nuke uh, issues here in town. They were at the Wednesday night Hanford uh, public testimony meeting about bringing that radioactive waste. I may be from all over the country. I don't, I'm not sure the exact details, <coughs> but I know they want to bring it <coughs> from there to here. And they want to put, bring it through Portland, maybe, maybe through Washington, on our highways anyway. And they're going to be bringing that into, into Hanford. They're trying to. And they had a public testimony that night. <coughs> Miriam, Miriam was on the show a while back when we were talking about the rally that was going on up in, in Richland. <coughs> and uh, with a couple other people as well. Uh, I don't know who all is going to be on the program with her. But there are going to be some folks here talking about uh, these issues. And uh, if there's anything that's more devastating to uh, the people and to the land than coal, it would be nuclear. Although coal, you see the problems. Uh, nuclear radiation, you don't necessarily see it. 
We're having issues right now with Fukushima that we don't even know about, that the corporate media is not covering. And uh, maybe there's a little bit of the sky is falling going on on the Internet. But there's a lot of uh, very reputable people that are talking about what is really going on. And there's a lot more going on than just a bunch of junk from the tsunami coming towards us. Uh, it's a whole lot more than that. So if anybody wants to make a quick comment, we got about three minutes. Uh, I want to make sure to, to let folks know that 9 o'clock, uh, City Lights will be uh, playing that. Uh, we'll be organizing a show ab around the uh, radiation and what's going on over there in, in uh, oh, I think we got a phone call. We got about time for one phone call. First caller and last caller, you're on the air. Yeah. Hey, oh. Hey. Well, you, nope. you still got ear. You still got eardrums there. Hello. Can you hear me? <clears throat> All right. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear yep. me? Yeah, I can uh, barely hear you, but uh, I'll just go ahead and. If All right. Yeah, going. you got about a minute and a half here. Okay. Real quick. Um. Uh. Thank you very much for uh, the uh, coal rally, and uh, I would like to give a shout out for the uh, the Hanford News. Um. One really good program that comes across from uh, Tualatin Valley is a program that runs monthly called the water spot right and uh they have for an hour you can watch and get uh some really good in-depth information in fact that's the uh, program i watched to uh find out about the uh the uh hearing uh the hanford is, hearing is that, up there is, last week was that the and, one with uh, gerald paulette pardon me was that the one with gerald paulette i think so yeah and uh but anyway uh i'll end it with this uh uh, Nancy Matella runs the uh, the water spot now, and before her, Kathy Newcomb, and uh, they do a really good job of uh, alerting people to uh, what's happening with water quality, uh, uh, Bull Run, uh, Hanford, the Columbia mm -hmm. River, everything like that. And so uh, if viewers get a chance to look up TVC TV and uh, find the water spot for the viewing times in their area, uh, check your local listings, as they say. And thank you very much, Jim. Thank you for the All right. volunteers. I think it might be on the Internet, too. That, yeah, that, I believe it is. That particular show, at least, is on the Internet. I ran across it the other day. All yeah, right. Okay. We're All right. Well, thank I Thank you very much. All right, appreciate the call. Bye. Hey, folks, don't forget nine o'clock. We're gonna have, there's a, something that's gonna do a good follow up on that that Hanford public testimony, and maybe talking a little bit about the the rally that happened uh, April fifteenth, where I picked up this bug that took my voice away just about. But it'll come back, and uh, I'm sure glad the image came back. Appreciate the crew. They did a great job. They. Uh, Got around that problem we had, and uh, always wish it didn't happen, but things happen. You know, as they say, feces occurs. But anyway, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week. I want to thank the crew again. I want to thank Frank for doing such a good job of providing the footage of uh, RFK there. Uh, when he wasn't, he, that wasn't what he set out to do, but uh, he did a great job. So thanks for tuning in. See you next week.